Welcome to Med Mythbusters HIV. I'm Rachel Deer with DKB Med. Today we have a webinar that's a little different. Our faculty will separate fact from fiction by debunking some common myths about HIV and women. Now I'd like to introduce our esteemed faculty, Dr. Anna Powell, Assistant Professor of Gynecology and Obstetrics at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Our learning objectives are assess strategies to improve care of women with HIV, and describe recommendations for infant feeding for women living with HIV. Dr. Powell, take it away. Thank you, Rachel. Um, today, we're going to be dispelling some myths about HIV in women. So let's get started. Our first myth is that HIV is not a big deal anymore. And so obviously, this is false. Um, for those of us who work in the field, we know this to be true every day, but um, certainly to the lay public, it may seem like you know, we're not talking about HIV very much. But as of uh, 2023, there were still approximately 38,500 new HIV diagnoses being made. And so overall, um, this is the numbers have been decreasing. So this 2023 number represents a 17% decrease from 2008, but incidence has been relatively stable since 2013. And the, um, the National HIV AIDS uh, strategy for ending the HIV epidemic has set forth specific targets for new HIV diagnoses. And for 2025, the goal is to reduce total number of new HIV uh, diagnoses to 9,300. And by 2030, um, the number is the target number is 3,000 new HIV diagnoses per year. So obviously, we still have a lot of work to do in that field. For our next myth, only men get HIV. So this is also categorically false. And while approximately uh, 79% of new HIV diagnoses in 2023 occurred among cisgender men, uh, typically men who have sex with men. Um, we, it's important to know that all people, regardless of their gender, may have exposure to HIV. And cisgender women make up about 19% of new diagnoses. Transgender women make up about 2%. And then transgender men and those who um, self-identify as other, you know, make up a much smaller percentage. But the important takeaway here is that um, anyone can be exposed and susceptible to HIV. New HIV diagnoses among women um, are most likely to be from heterosexual contact, and that accounts for about 80% of new cases among women. And when we break down uh, new diagnoses among women by race and ethnicity, Black or African American women continue to be disproportionately affected by HIV, with Black or African American women um, making up more than half of new HIV diagnoses among women uh, compared to, you know, their relative um, population density in the United States. And we need to keep in mind that these important disparities in HIV incidence are multifactorial and can um, be attributable to complex issues like racism, poverty, HIV stigma, and other healthcare barriers. Our next myth is that HIV is a young person's illness. This is a myth. When we look specifically at new HIV diagnoses among women, um, again, slightly older data, but from 2019, 13% were among 13 to 24-year-olds. Um, and then women aged 25 to 34 actually have the highest number of new HIV diagnoses. But when we look at this graph, almost 60% um, of the new diagnoses were among those uh, 35 and older. So pretty significant here. And then as of 2022, approximately 69% of women living with HIV are 45 years or older. Our next myth is that people with HIV know that they're sick. So unfortunately, this is also not true. And 
statistics show that only 50 to 90% of people with a new or acute HIV infection are symptomatic, which means that potentially up to half of new HIV diagnoses um, occur among people who may not have any symptoms at all. And so not surprisingly, um, this may explain the drop off in the care cascade where not everybody who um, who is infected with HIV knows that they're infected or knows their status, followed by, you know, receiving a diagnosis, followed by getting into care. So potentially if more people knew they were some or more people had symptoms, um, that might lead people to uh, obtain a diagnosis. But a key takeaway here is to, uh, for providers especially, to have a low index of sp- suspicion and, and test for HIV and, um, according to recommendations. Our next myth is that PrEP is not for cisgender women. PrEP, we know, is pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. And of course, it is for cisgender women. But it is also true that PrEP is underutilized. According to the CDC, or Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, only 10% of eligible women are being offered PrEP in clinic. And as an obstetrician gynecologist, I'm acutely aware that this is a, when when I see a patient in the office, that's an incredible opportunity for us to talk about their HIV risk and so potentially offer that patient PrEP. There are currently two available options for cisgender women. The first is tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate with emtricitabine. This is a daily oral medication that's meant to be used continuously for the period of time where the person is at risk for HIV acquisition. We know that it takes about 21 days to achieve adequate drug levels in vaginal tissue. And unlike with men who have sex with men, it must be taken every day. Um, So it can't just be used episodically to be effective. And the more uh, adherent somebody is to therapy, the more likely it is to work. The second option is cabotegravir, which is an injectable option that's given as a bi-monthly injection. Um, This has also been an exciting recent development. Um, And hopefully coming down the pipeline very soon, we'll have lenacapavir, which is another injectable option that's given biannually. There was some very exciting data that was just uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine from a large randomized control trial that showed very um, significant risk reduction for HIV acquisition. And the other just point I wanted to mention here is that uh, a person's willingness to try PrEP among heterosexual individuals increases if recommended by a healthcare provider. So again, just a shameless plug for healthcare providers, especially OBGYNs, to um, talk to your patients about PrEP. So our next myth is that people with HIV cannot use hormonal contraception. So thankfully, this is also false. And for the vast majority of cases, hormonal contraception can be used with antiretroviral therapy in women living with HIV, assuming they don't have other contraindications. Um, And just as a side note, for anyone who needs to double check an interaction, you are able to use the Liverpool interaction checker to double check one's ART regimen. So very few drug-drug interactions um, exist is the takeaway. And so thinking about common regimens like injection uh, depo or uh, medroxyprogesterone acetate and uh, levonorgestrel releasing IUDs, these can be used without restriction. Contraceptive implants and vaginal rings, um, these may have decreased efficacy with efferens-based regimens. So would counsel patients about using a backup method or potentially an alternative uh, contraceptive option. Fortunately, there are no significant drug-drug interactions with newer regimens like the integrase strand inhibitors and hormonal contraceptives generally. For those users that are on a combination oral contraceptive, a patch ring or contraceptive implant, um, we might uh, counsel them about considering an al- additional or alternative method if they are using efavirenz or a ritonavir-boosted darunavir regimen. And for those that are on a drosperinone-containing hormonal contraceptive, we want to be mindful about hyperkalemia in the setting of um, darunavir boosted with cobicistat in which clinical monitoring or an alternative method is advised um, and should be 
uh, considered contraindicated for those that are on a cobicistat boosted atazanavir regimen. In terms of emergency contraception, um, for those on an efavirenz-based antiretroviral therapy regimen, we want to make sure that we are offering an increased levonorgestrel dose. So instead of 1.5 milligrams, we want to give 3 milligrams. And then um, just keeping in mind also that um, the alternative medications like uh, ulipristal acetate may also be less effective in this setting for those who are on efavirenz-based regimens. So either consider using the double-dosed levonorgestrel or placing a copper IUD for emergency contraception. And why should we care about this in general? Well, women living with HIV um, have been shown to have high rates of unintended pregnancy. In one study of from the Medical Monitoring Project, among 382 women, 85% had one or more unplanned pregnancies after knowing their HIV status. And other more recent studies have shown unattended pregnancy rates as high as 68%. So, you know, I would not let um, ART dissuade you from talking to your patients about hormonal contraception, especially in light of potentially unintended pregnancy rates. Our next myth is that women living with HIV should not get pregnant. And this has not been true for many, many years. It's important for providers to realize that, uh, you know, HIV is not a reason that women would not want to get pregnant. And we should make sure that we're asking about fertility desires and intentions. Um, most studies have shown that pregnancy desires and reproductive decision making don't vary by HIV status. Women living with HIV should also have access to preconception counseling to optimize viral suppression make sure that they're on a pregnancy-preferred antiretroviral therapy regimen that has a good safety and efficacy profile, talk about partner testing, and potentially partner pre-exposure prophylaxis. If the person living with HIV on antiretroviral therapy uh, is also virally suppressed pre-pregnancy, then their risk of transmitting to their baby is less than 0.1%. And then also know that there has been updated guidance on breast or chest feeding in the setting of HIV. So there has been much, uh, much work done in this field and a lot of advancements made, which have been exciting. Our next myth is that births need to be via cesarean delivery. So thankfully, also false. So if a pregnant person with HIV, again, maintains viral suppression throughout their pregnancy, then they are certainly el eligible for a vaginal delivery, barring other obstetric contraindications. A cesarean delivery is typically recommended when the viral load at the 34 to 36 week mark exceeds 1,000 copies per mil, or if there are adherence concerns with somebody's uh, antiretroviral therapy regimen. Um, having a cesarean delivery uh, pre-labor, so around 38 weeks, reduces the risk of perinatal HIV transmission by 50%, which is why this was an important recommendation prior to advances in ART regimens. And if somebody is coming in to have a cesarean delivery for an elevated viral load, then it's important that they also have an infusion of zidovudine given prior to the planned cesarean delivery. Our next myth is that birthing people with HIV should not breastfeed. This is a very important myth to dispel and one that's sort of actively in the process of being dispelled, I'll say. The most recent perinatal HIV guidelines from 20, January of 2023 now recommend shared decision-making for women living with HIV with their providers to talk about the best infant feeding modality for that for the patient, for the mother-infant diet. And so just to give some context, the risk of breast or chest feeding in the context of viral suppression may be between 0.3 to 1%. And our team and others have shown that multidisciplinary team management is recommended for an optimal patient experience. Uh, maternal and infant health disparities are associated with an absence of breast or chest feeding. So we know that HIV-exposed infants who are not infected still have worse outcomes potentially compared to HIV-unexposed, uninfected infants. And so there may be some health disparities associated with not breastfeeding. 
But while the uh, while mom and baby are breastfeeding, we still want to make sure that they're both. We're still doing viral load surveillance, so it's important to make sure that the maternal viral load doesn't exceed. 50 copies per mil, especially not 200 copies per mil, but we want to do everything we can to help adherence to mom's ART regimen. And depending on what was decided with the infant's providers for infant post-exposure prophylaxis, make sure that baby's taking their their regimen as well. And um, just to note that there's there is very little consensus about the best post-exposure reg- regimen for infants. So that's also part of the shared decision-making between um, women living with HIV and their providers. And our final myth to dispel is that menopause is the same for women living with and without HIV. So menopause is having a moment, as we know, and it is important to remember that um, this is a myth, especially for women living with HIV, for a variety of reasons that we'll go over now. So firstly, menopause can occur about five years earlier in women living with HIV compared to women without HIV. And women living with HIV may have more intense menopausal symptoms. Because of HIV or tobacco use or chronic infection, lower estrogen levels, potentially stress response or other immunologic factors, uh, women living with HIV may also start to have more irregular menses earlier. So you know, potentially as early as 35. Um, we know that generally menopause, menopause, of course, is certainly a risk factor for bone mineral density loss, um, but so is HIV. So having these two risk factors together um, should make us increase our awareness to screen patients for osteoporosis, neurologic, and cardiovascular diseases. Um, additionally, anti-malarian hormone levels are and so AMH is a protein marker of ovarian reserve. These levels are lower among women living with HIV compared to those without HIV. And so this has important implications for, you know, fertility in one's later, later 30s um, and counseling patients about potentially, um, you know, pregnancy planning fertility, which is, again, why it's important to ask about fertility plans. Um, and also keeping in mind that the more immunosuppressed a person is, the less likely they are to ovulate. So certainly counseling patients about um, ART adherence and managing immunosuppression to um, give some uh, anticipatory guidance about what to expect from menopause. And finally, we have some key takeaways from our HIV myth busting for today. About one in five new HIV diagnoses occurs in cisgender women. About two-thirds of women living with HIV are 45 years or older. PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis is safe and effective in cisgender women. Hormonal contraception is safe for women living with HIV with few drug-drug interactions between hormonal contraception and antiretroviral therapy to consider. Breast or chest feeding is generally safe when the birthing person is adherent to antiretroviral therapy and virally suppressed with a rate of transmission that's thought to be less than 1%. And finally, cesarean delivery is recommended when pregnant people have a viral load greater than 1,000 copies per mil in the late third trimester, which is typically 34 to 36 weeks. Thank you for watching Med Mythbusters. I hope we have dispelled some myths for you for HIV and women. Thank you, Dr. Powell, for busting those myths about HIV and women. And thank you for watching. If you'd like to claim credit, please click the claim credit button to take the evaluation. Your thoughts and comments are important and help us develop additional education for med mythbusters. For CME information, check out mythhiv.dkbmed.com. For DKB Med, I'm Rachel Deere.